know what's next. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, we are ready. Uh, welcome to UTSA, and thank you all for being here. I'm Harriet Romo. I'm a professor in the sociology department and the director of the Mexico Center here at UTSA. And so I'm moderating this panel this morning on contextualizing elder care among Mexican origin caregivers in the 21st in 21st century Mexico and the United States. So the context and the neighborhoods of where these folks are living are, are very important. So we've got some, some really interesting presentations this morning, and we'll go right through the order of the, the, our program. But I'll introduce each one, and then when it's their turn, they'll go to the podium to present so that they'll be captured on the video for the people participating online. So our first speaker is Dr. Carolyn Mendes Luck. Uh, she has a PhD in public health from the School of Public Health at UCLA and a, a master's in public health from in community health sciences from UCLA as well. She's now an assistant professor in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at Oregon State University. Uh, she's been an active scholar. She was a Robles, uh, Garcia Robles Fellow in Mexico City. Uh, she's been a researcher that has directed some big projects at UCLA. And she's also been uh, very active in teaching about the aging frontier and uh, taught also and lectured about race and class. So welcome, Dr. Mendes Luck. Thank you, everybody. If you can't hear me, please. Uh, Raise your hand, and I'll try to speak into this mic. So um, I'm very pleased to be with all of you today to talk about my research. And I first want to say thank you to Rogelio and Jackie for the kind invitation to speak. And I'm going to be talking about informal family caregiving among women of Mexican origin. So women from Mexico City and Mexican origin women living in um, East Los Angeles, California. So I'm going to give a little background first. So historically, women predominate as caregivers. And this is a context of care that occurs throughout the world, not just in, um, in the Americas. And when we think about um, the Mexican culture, and it's so closely tied to caregiving, that it's important to look at what the literature says about the Mexican culture, particularly about the family. So there's a rich description in the literature that the Mexican family is united, lives within an extended family network, and that people within the family are, are bounded to one another, depend on one another, and sacrifice um, for each other for the greater good of the family. So what I just described can be called familismo, uh, Marianismo and Respeto are two other cultural values that are important um, that have been written about in the literature. And there have been some critics about these concepts, though, particularly that they simplify and romanticize um, complex interpersonal relationships and processes. So it's not without its critics, although this is what the literature says about the Mexican culture. So in my prior work, I found that the tenants are actually present in the caregiving experiences of Mexican origin women. And important forms of caregiving include emotional aspects of giving care. Companionship, love, and attention, all of these are forms of caregiving. Um, that I have found in my research. And lastly, this idea of attentiveness, or in Spanish it's called estar pendiente. That's an integral part of caregiving. It, it's about vigilance and watching out and always being there for the person um, being cared for. So this study that I'm going to talk about today explored the cultural beliefs related to family care and aging among 
Mexican of, or, of, of women of Mexican origin. And particularly, we were interested in examining what were the gender roles um, related to giving care to older adults. What were the beliefs about older adults and aging beliefs in general? And so that's what I'll be pursuing today. I'm going to focus, though, on two areas, gender roles and the elderly. So this analysis is actually um, an analysis of two different data sets that we combined. Um, they came from two prior studies that I was a PI on. And the first data set came um, from Mexico City, was collected in Mexico City for my dissertation. And then the second set came from interviews with women in East Los Angeles. The East Los Angeles study replicated the study from Mexico. So both studies share the same qualitative study design methods and instruments, including, including the topics that um, are covered on the interview guide and the um, eligibility criteria. So the analysis for this um, study was first, well, a couple of things. So first we took the data that had already been transcribed, we uploaded it into Atlas TI, which is a, a software program to manage um, qualitative, uh, qualitative um, data. We analyzed the data in the, um, in the language of the interview, whether it was in Spanish or in English. And then we followed a systematic protocol in our analysis. The first step of that was since we had these two studies, we had to combine them both into one. Each study had its own code book, or code list, and coded terms. And we had to merge all of those, reconcile, so that we could have one code list for the two sets of data, which is now one big combined data set. The next, uh, and that was very mechanical, and, um, and it just took a took a long time to do. The next part of the analysis, which was really the analysis, is that we did three steps. Content analysis, taxonomic analysis, uh, organization, and code mapping. And these three steps build on each other to identify, at the end, identify thematic content. And so there are specific procedures within each step on how to do that. I'm not going to go into detail on how to do that. I'd have to be happy to answer questions, though, if you have any later on. Um, but right now, we're at the code mapping stage. So we are still developing thematic content. However, I do have some preliminary data that I'm able to share with you today. So first, I want to give you a look at the sample. So we interviewed a total of 85 women. 41 were from Mexico City. 44 from East Los Angeles. And of those in East Los Angeles, 18 were US born and 26 were immigrant women. Uh, Mexico City caregivers tended to be younger than um, their East LA counterparts. And they, more of them worked outside the home and were married. Also not shown here, the, um, for most of the study participants for the full sample, uh, they had lower than secondary education levels and lower incomes um, with respect to the average incomes in each country. So they were not well-resourced women. And lastly, they were all long-term residents in their local communities. So this table shows some caregiving characteristics uh, you know, of the caregiving situation and um, characteristics of the care receiver. And what I like to point out here is that in terms of the length of caregiving, that seemed to be similar across groups. Um, and the majority of caregivers uh, cared for um, a parent, followed by a husband, and then after um, other relatives. The majority of caregivers uh, shared houses, shared the same house as the person they were caring for. And East LA caregivers t were older on average than um, the immigrant women or the Mexican women. And another interesting fact that I want to point out is that the Mexico City caregivers were taking care of relatively healthy older adults um, compared to the East LA caregivers. So when you look at that, they, 
there, at 27 percent of uh, caregivers were taking care of someone who had no physical illness and had no need for ADL help. Okay, so they were relatively healthy. Um, whereas the caregivers in East LA were taking care of really highly impaired um, older adults or older adults with multiple conditions. So this first series of results is on social and gender roles. So we found that women socialized, were socialized into the role throughout their lives. This wasn't something that was talked about in the family, um, at least not explicitly. Rather, it was something that they learned over time through observing others. So they saw caregiving being played out by other family members, and they were taught by those experiences, as well as being taught how to do some caregiving activities by those family members. But there were really no main, like, explicit discussions about um, the obligation to provide care. So I also want to say here that most if not all the women, regardless of where they lived, felt that caregiving was something that women will always do in the future, going forward. We also found that fulfilling the role was an opportunity to serve a parent or a non-spousal relative, to see the family member improve or maintain their health, or to ensure respect and good treatment of a family member. And so when we looked a, more at the data, looked closely at the data, we saw that this fulfillment of the role was viewed a little bit differently for these two groups. Mexican caregivers saw this fulfillment as satisfaction, whereas um, the US-born caregivers really focused on fulfilling the role so as to provide good treatment, good medical treatment, good physical care to the um, to the, their family member. And then lastly, we saw a, sm a small group of women talk about this idea that even though they know women will always be the caregiver, that a man's role should be the same um, in terms of caregiving. And we found that interesting that although they said, yes, a man's role should be the same, but that's not what's going to happen or what they expect that is going to happen, but that it should be the same. And then when we looked at, well, who, who's in this group of, this small group of women, they were primarily U.S. born women and immigrant women. Very few um, Mexican caregivers um, expressed the same sentiment. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. First, in terms of a general in, in general. And this one comes from, let's see, what's her name? This one quote comes from Julia. She's 37 years old at the time of the interview and she had been caring for her 68-year-old mother-in-law for the past 15 years. And she said, men are more about the street working and going out more, but women are about the house and the children. So here we can see the differentiation in um, responsibilities by men and women in general. The second one has to do with uh, gender roles related to caregiving. And this quote comes from Susanna. She was 49 years old and she was caring for her 80-year-old mother for the past year. She was an immigrant caregiver living in East Los Angeles. And she said, women are more understanding. Men just focus on working and they forget about the rest. He helps economically but he doesn't help or understand the way a woman does. So here again, we can see that there's this differentiation in men and women's focuses, but also underlying in, in this quote is the idea that women are inherently better at caregiving. Okay, thanks. Yeah, keep me on, keep me on top. So, um, so this next set is about um, beliefs about the elderly. And so what we found was that caregivers talked about the elderly as being a vulnerable group of people. 
that they were vulnerable to being viewed by others as being a burden, a hassle, or getting in the way. Um, some caregivers felt that elders lost um, status in the family or their identity or their authority in the family because of, of increasing dependency, role reversals because of being ill. It was, this change of role was not necessarily because of chronological age. It had to do more with health and other extenuating circumstances. So this um, exemplar comes from a, um, let's see, from Laura, and she was taking care of her 71-year-old husband for the past 10 years. She's also an immigrant um, caregiver, and she says, when a person gets older, they lose the capability to make decisions. So then they are indecisive. They don't know if they are doing good things or bad things. So then the children help the grandparents make decisions. Yes, because when they are already too sick, they can't decide anymore. Okay, again, this quote, getting at the um, sort of changes in roles due to a diminished capacity. So this sh small snippet of findings that I shared with you do um, or are consistent with some of the tenets that I talked about earlier, familismo, marianismo, and respeto. But also, these themes played out differently across groups. And this may speak to changes in, in uh, or, or reflect an acculturation experience uh, for, um, for the immigrant caregivers. But nevertheless, there's some ideals, cultural ideals that still persisted despite um, living in a different environment and social context. So there were some limitations. Um, one of them I'll point out, because I, I don't want to run out of too much time, is that the data, even though the, there were parallel studies, um, the data were collected at two different times. And so that fact um, could have affected um, the results that, that, that we found, because women were coming in at different historical periods of time, different lifetimes, uh, things happening in their lives that could have affected how they answered their questions. Also, the data for the first study is 18 years old. So we have to ask the question, how relevant is it to 2016? But, but I argue that the data still are relevant because we saw some consistencies across the groups. And, and so because of that consistency in some of those findings that I tend to think, well, the, the data isn't so bad after all. So lastly, I'm just going to leave this sort of as a discussion. I'm not going to um, talk about this too much, but I'm going to pose the questions here. So we know that the landscape of our lives are changing, and in particular as um, those related to, uh, to caregiving are women's increased workforce participation, delayed and reduced fertility, population aging, all of these, among other factors, are happening in the Americas today. So what implications do they have for caregiving? Will family ties weaken? Will we still see this familismo play out? Will expectations change? Will caregiving remain a gendered responsibility? Will beliefs about elderly shift to accommodate changes? Will future elderly adjust their expectations? The results that I showed here, I think, indicate that there is a shift underway, um, but that women will continue to struggle to fulfill their role obligations amidst all of this changing landscape. So what will happen, I think, is really up for a conversation. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You set the stage for the questions at the end of the, the panel discussions. All right, our, our next presenter is Kate Cagney, and she is an associate professor of sociology and health studies and director of the Population Research Center, NORC, at, and the, at the University of uh, Chicago. Uh, she has worked with uh, issues of social inequality and its relationship to health with a focus on neighborhoods, race, and aging, and the life course. She brings urban sociology theory 
uh, and methods and research to health examining outcomes such as asthma prevalence, physical activity, mortality during crises, and, and looking at the evolution of a new community uh, in Chicago called Lakeside. She also focuses on the development of new methods to define and measure neighborhoods and social, network, social networks with smartphones related to data collection. So thank you very much, Kate, for being here. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I wanted to say special thanks to, um, to Jackie for, for bringing me here, um, and also to all of you for um, the great day we had yesterday. And I, I know I, I enjoyed all of our conversations, but now I feel like I have to do a little work. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through some research on neighborhood social context and its relationship to health. And I want to focus, um, particularly given the substance of, of this conference, um, uh, you know, really thinking carefully about the context of community and how it might matter for the health of older Latinos. And so let's look at that diagram. One thing that we, uh, Chicago School Theory doesn't do is really think carefully and think about these, this point in the distribution in which we're thinking about concentration in these groups. Um, so this is collective efficacy theory and its relationship to health, where we think about structural features, and it's this piece, ethnic heterogeneity, which we're going to draw today, think about it in relation to residential and stability communities, economic disadvantage. When, when this work was originally theorized by Sean McKay, Burgess, and others, um, at Chicago, it, it was you know, primarily meant to describe the research in crime. And what we've tried to do, um, you know, with my, uh, my work with Chris Browning, is to look carefully at how these same kinds of features that might alter community context would have implications for health in the same way they might have implications for crime. Um, and again, this is what we're trying to think about, the, the glue that connects these structural features of community with particular kinds of outcomes. <laughs> So what are our research questions? So we want to ask, do changing residential patterns have implications for the health of older adults? Will Latinos have fewer physical and mental health decrements over time when compared to whites? And will racial and ethnic health disparities be greater in changing neighborhoods? <laughs> uh, second, uh, does baseline population composition, and we could think of this generally as an enclave, and this may come up in the Q&A, what we all think an enclave might be, and how we try to define one, um, with uh, secondary data, which is really hard to, to do, or we use the census to help us, and how that might matter for the impact of that change. Um, will an influx of Latinos in high concentration Latino neighborhoods reinforce this health promoting aspect in community? Um, and will an influx of Latinos in low concentration neighborhoods lead to a health compromising context? So really the story is let's try to understand the distinctions between high and low concentration communities and how change in those communities, adding additional people of that same um, ethnic group matters for the health of older adults. That's the story. So we're trying to adjudicate this theory. Is it about um, ethnic revitalization in community or is it you know, a concern about ethnic heterogeneity and the extent to which disparate groups may not have the same kind of balance on community or may not right, have the same language on the face of which they would share cultural bonds that could lead to higher levels of social capital or quality of efficacy. So that's in some, if you will, sort of the sociological puzzle we're trying to get at. Okay, so um, I'm going to use the National Social Life Health and Aging Project. Uh, Linda Wade is the PI, and then Linda Wade is a friend to many in this room. Um, it's a national representative panel study of community dwelling older adults, uh, wave one, 2005, 2006, wave two, 2010, 2011. What are my That's hard. Yeah. All right, I'm not the only one that's hearing it. Good. Um, Respondents are linked to, to, to Census 2000 and the American Community Survey. The sample is restricted to those who survive and are able to participate in wave two. I, I do want to take, I know I probably don't have a lot of time, but do you want to take a second to say NSHAP it's this really terrific data source that combines both um, you know, sort of traditional social survey data along with um, really amazing biological data. And probably what is most, what is rich as we might argue from these data is it's also coupled with really detailed data on social networks and change in social networks over time. Also, I know, it's not exciting. Also, um, 
What's great if you're interested in things like the recession and the impact of the recession on the health of older adults, EdChef is a terrific source because you know, by some frequent, we have a data collection effort that right balance the economic crisis. So just as an aside, and FYI, people are interested in effort. Great. Um, our outcomes that you know, many people uh, talked about these, these outcomes yesterday, so I'll just remind you that um, we're looking at activities of daily living, difficulty in seven items, and depressive symptoms with the 11 item short form of the CDSC. And I know we didn't talk about some of those measures yesterday, so I won't describe them in detail here. Um, neighborhood variables, percent change in the 2000 census from the American Community Survey. So we're actually, we can talk about this too in the Q&A, but we're really looking at percent change in community, not the raw number of people who are adding in community or that percent, but the extent to which it's altered the composition of community. So if you 10% uh, Latino population and it increases by 50%, then you've got 15% with me here on how we do that calculation. Yeah, so it's a very simple kind of characterization, but really built off, off that larger map I showed you earlier. Um, so we look at uh, present population composition, those below poverty, again motivated by the uh, earlier Chicago work I shared with you, um, population current residents in different house, those over 65, um, and I won't draw this out in detail today, but we're also really interested in this role of disorder, and we ask interviewers in the NSHAP data source to provide insight into whether the house is in, in a disordered state and the homes around it are disordered. Okay, individual level variables, race, form, <coughs> status, gender, age, uh, health status, number of conditions, cognitive health, and then our social network characteristics, which I, I won't describe um, in detail here. Um, analyses, we're using logistic regression for our ADL limitations, uh, OLS for the depressive symptomatology, uh, wave one way to account for the complex survey design, and we spend a lot of time doing neighborhood effects research, and I will you know, take hierarchical linear modeling anywhere I can, <laughs> but we're actually not doing it here um, because we don't really have the nested structure in these data um, to pursue the analysis in that way, although we may do that as a check. Um, all models control for baseline health. What I'm going to walk through are you know, briefly look at some individual characteristics. I want to concentrate on the neighborhood characteristics and then think about the interaction. And what we want to focus on most is whether is, is the kind of health result we see for, for folks who are resting in low concentration communities versus high concentration communities. Okay, these are our summary statistics just to show you. This isn't, you know, uh, NCHEP is amazing in many ways. Um, we have some oversampling for the Latino population. Um, but still a relatively low um, sample of just over 230. Um, I just want to show you briefly here, these are our neighborhood characteristics by track, and so we're seeing um, for whites, African Americans, and Latinos, significant changes in the percent increase um, for Latinos who, who rest in their communities, and less so for, for the Latinos in our sample because they already were residing. How many? Five. Okay. <laughs> They were already residing in communities that were dominant Latinos, so that's why we don't see as dramatic a shape of change. And I'll also show you too that we have some uh, nice variation on that disorder measure. Okay, so this is our first model on difficulty with ADLs, um, and we see sort of as we anticipated that uh, the Latino population in the NSHAP sample was less likely over the course of the uh, course of time between wave one and wave two, less likely to develop um, new activities of daily living limitations, um, so that answers our first question. Um, and we also see for depressive symptomatology, um, again, um, less likely right, to develop depressive sympt symptomatology over the interval. But sort of keep that in mind because that's going to be contingent on these context measures that we uh, described earlier. Um, so this is neighborhood baseline and changes for any difficulty with activities of daily living and depressive symptoms. And what I really want to note here is that we seem to see sort of something that's suggestive in the change in neighborhood disorder over time. So it's to increase the odds um, of developing depressive symptomatology. But in, at least in this characterization, we don't see any effect right now from percent Latino in the trap or change in that trap for our two outcome variables. Okay, so this is really our key result. Um, and so this is race, ethnicity, and change in percent Latino and track, those living in high and low concentration Latino neighborhoods. 
Uh, so we see with a low concentration Latino neighborhood, you have a, uh, the percent change, Latino and Trek. We actually see um, a, you know, a coefficient that suggests that, um, you know, that that change has a particularly right, important role in the extent to which uh, people are developing different <laughs> sentimentology. Um, in the high concentration Latino neighborhoods, it actually appears to be protective, right, for developing sentimentology. So again, so in the low concentration neighborhoods, where you're seeing an influx of Latinos, um, the older adults are re reporting higher levels of depression. In the high concentration neighborhoods, an influx of, of, of Latinos is protective. Are you all with me? <laughs> so what we see, and what's fascinating, I think, to us, is this divergence influenced by the concentration of, of um, population distribution. And we see something that's sort of suggestive um, on the ABL front. But it's mostly this depressive result that we're, we're most interested in. So um, over a five-year period, Latinos um, in our sample reporting fewer activities and daily living limitations when compared to whites. Racial ethnic health disparities appear to increase in these changing neighborhoods. So when you have a greater influx of population of any form, right, you're seeing greater change um, in health status. The health of Latinos was differentially impacted by living in the neighborhood, experiencing greater influx of Latinos. And this is our key finding. Um, <clears throat> Latinos are sampling higher levels of depressive symptoms in low concentration, changing Latino neighborhoods. And that our Latino older adults had fewer ADLs and depressive symptoms in high concentration changing neighborhoods. And really our, our hope here, I guess, is that this approach may help resolve the mixed findings that we cited earlier related to health, like deficit, and crime, um, where concentration right, might need a particular kind of treatment. That we want to think about the nonlinear aspects of concentration. Um, so, Limitations, no measures of culturation, language, length of time in the U.S., um, experience of discrimination, selection, neighbor choice may be associated with health, and mortality selection may underestimate these racial ethnic health disparities. Census tracts, of course, are crude proxies for neighborhoods, and we're developing a lot of new methods now, um, one of which we're tracking people with iPhones and having them define their neighborhoods for us, rather than imposing neighborhood definitions based on municipal boundaries. And I'll conclude by saying the Latino population growth is critical dimension of neighborhood change, so we want to emphasize that. Rapidly changing neighborhoods may contribute to racial ethnic health disparities, particularly for older adults. Um, attention to composition, compositional differences and thresholds. Um, and again, right, that, that there's really, as we think, this nonlinear effect um, may provide insight into community's impact on health. And I'll stop there. Thank you.